Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant. (laughs) There's Jerry over there. And we're bringing you all the news fast as lightning (laughs) in this episode on Pony Express. (laughs) Hey, you resurrected the Don't Be Dumb Josh (laughs) for a moment. Then you're also resurrected. Standing, you're also standing on your head in your chair. <laughs> this is like the end of primal fear, man. The don't be dumb, Josh, never went away. There's nothing but the don't be dumb, Whoa. Josh. Whoa. Mm-hmm. I hope I didn't ruin that for anybody just now. Yeah. I probably did, but come on. It was the 80s. Yeah, there was a bit of a discussion about uh, on the Movie Crush Facebook page about me spoiling things that are old movies. Like Jaws? Like the shark dies? <laughs> like... A bunch of people came to my defense. They were like, you know, there's a limit on spoilers. Like, if you're talking about a 10-year-old and older movie, like, come on. Who uh, who was it that chose Jaws? Was it Roman? Yeah, Mars? Roman Mars. He's got great taste, man. I watched that movie twice in the last two weeks. Oh, it's so good. The first time it was on mute, and I was still, like, en- engrossed by it. Yeah. And then I recently watched it from, like, start to finish um, for the first time in— well over a decade. And I it's was like, oh my God, this movie. movie is good. It is basically perfect. Yep. Everything about it. It's just enjoyable. It's beautifully shot. The characters are great. It's just wonderful. Here's to swimming with bow-legged women. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> man, he's he's quite a character. God, Robert he? Shaw is so good in that movie. And Old Dreyfus, point. man. Yeah. All of them. It's just so great. Yep. Even you know, Roy Scheider. Yeah, my favorite moment in that whole movie, I think. Well, gosh, there's so many, but... Don't spoil it. It's when uh, that real moment, like Spielberg peppers in these moments that just make it such a richer film, like uh, when he's sitting there with his kid before Dreyfus comes over for dinner that night. Uh-huh. And he just has that moment with his son where he asks him for a kiss, and it's just leaving in just little tidbits like that make the movie so much more rich. Yeah. Love it. That's our Spielberg. <laughs> uh, I have a question for you. Uh-huh. Has there ever been more attention paid to a utter failure of a business that was <laughs> only open for about 19 months than the Pony I'm Express? trying to think. <laughs> trying to think. It's really remarkable. Uh, yeah, it's like the new Coke of mail service. Because when you said this topic, I was like, oh, hot diggity dog, this is going to be great. And it's an interesting story, but it's like, wow, the Pony Express was a big, fat failure. Yeah, really this so one of the articles we're working from is called The Pony Express colon Riders of Destiny. <laughs> In parentheses couldn't resist that. Yeah. Um Christopher guy, Corbett. Christopher Corbett um and he basically makes the case that the most interesting thing about The Pony Express is the fact that we remember it at all. Yeah. That that's re- the real story behind it because that's a lot you're of absolutely his articles, right for sure. It was a big stinking Failure business-wise, it was a success as an actual mail service, but as a business, it was terrible. The timing was terrible. The whole structure of it was just a bad idea. It was just dumb. But it was, as far as a service goes, if you're looking at the very definition of the word service, it was invaluable for a lot of people. Yeah, so just to set the table real quick, if you don't know what we're talking about, the Pony Express was a delivery, a mail delivery system mm-hmm. uh, when the the transcontinental, well, I guess pre-transcontinental telegram, when it only went, how far east did that go at the time? St. Joe, Missouri. Okay, St. Joe, Missouri, and then it went west as far as? Sacramento. Sacramento. And the idea was to join those two lines so you would have a true transcontinental telegram, telegraph service. Mm -hmm. Uh, But before that happened, there were three entrepreneurs who said, we can close this gap because it takes weeks or months to get mail from east to west these days. And we can do that. We want to be able to do that in like a week to 10 days. Yeah, which was enormously ambitious because – if you sent mail overland, right, from, you know, between Missouri and California, it, it, you, maybe 25 days was a good thing to expect for the mail to get there, right? That's Missouri. And that's one way, okay? Yeah. If you wanted to send it by ship, m- months, 
couple months before the the person ever got the mail. Yeah, because you got to dig a river from Missouri <laughs> to Sacramento. You got to flood it, and then you got to run the ship down that channel. And then when you get to the other <laughs> side, you have to drain it and fill it back in. <laughs> And <laughs> start over the next time. It was a terrible idea. That this idea. is back when America was full of just complete <laughs> idiots. But nowadays, we know what we're doing. We've got the internet and Twitter and all that stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So there, there was this idea where if you were in California, which by this time was a state, and the reason California was a state before so much of the other parts of the country is because of the gold rush of yeah. 1849 brought a lot of people out west, and they started to build and and create these cities, and California was a state. So you had Americans living in a state that was geographically uh, isolated from the rest of the country. So they wanted news. They wanted newspapers. They wanted news of America back east. They wanted all this stuff. And again, the telegraph uh, lines weren't connected, so they set up this mail service to run in between them fast as lightning. And fast as lightning was about 10 days, like you said. And the whole route from St. Joseph's, Missouri to Sacramento took them about 1,800 miles, Yeah, which is a really long way. But the way that they did it, Chuck, in just 10 days was through a stroke of genius. Is that where I come in? I just set you up. (laughs) Yeah, they had about, uh, and they they don't have great records, and we'll get into that. But as far as we can tell, uh, and there's, boy, there's a lot of misinformation out there from Mm -hmm. over the years. A lot. Legend and lore and tall tales. Mm -hmm. But they had about 80 horseback riders, young, wiry young men, uh, who they compared to like a modern-day jockey. These were little guys. Yeah. And by all accounts, they could haul butt on horses, though. Uh, they had about 80 of these dudes, and they had about four or 500 horses and s- several dozen uh, what they called way stations or these stations in between where you would ride, 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 ride to a station, either switch riders or switch horses or both and get, you know, get a fresh horse. Or if you were <clears> worn <throat> out, you would <clears throat> hand the mail off, and we'll, we'll get to the, how that worked as well. Okay. And then they would go, and it was just a point-to-point thing where you would just move this mail as fast as you could ride a horse, basically. Yep, and so the horses would last for 10 to 15 miles, depending on how rough the terrain was in between way stations. And then at the way, the next way station, the rider would jump from one horse to another horse with this mail bag called a mochila, which could hold about 20 pounds of mail, and would ride on to the next uh, way station and switch horses again. And so the horses would go 10 to 15 miles, and the riders would go about 75 miles from what I've seen. Yeah, and this whole operation was uh, from a business called the Central Overland California and Pikes Peak Express Company uh, that was run by three gentlemen, uh, Russells, Majors, and Waddell, William Hepburn Russell, Alexander Majors, and William Bradford Waddell, who had Mm -hmm. already been in the the freight hauling business for military outposts, which uh, you would think would be a great money-making venture. But apparently, when they started the Pony Express, all accounts say that their business probably wasn't doing very well when they even started. Right. So they said, well, let's see, what is a money pit we can sink our remaining money into? (laughs) What makes no sense financially? They said, oh, the Pony Express. Yeah, because you said, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it failed, which we'll get to, but Mm -hmm. uh, you said that they held up to 20 pounds of mail in these uh, these saddlebags. Yeah. Again, by all accounts, they rarely had that much mail. Sometimes they would have eight or ten letters, and that's just not, you know, if you're in the shipping business, you're not maximizing your load. No, I did some a little bit of math. It wasn't hard, but I'm still proud of it. Okay. Um, so they charged $5 per half gram. Yeah, at first. And so the, the the mochila could hold 20 pounds. So 20 pounds times 32 is 640 or times $5 is $640. And in today's money, that's about 16640 bucks. It's not bad. It's not too bad. Um, but apparently it was way more to maintain this line than, than that. And uh, like you said, Plenty of these things only had a couple dozen letters in them at any given time. And the people who would use the Pony Express would write these letters on tissue paper to cut down on costs because, you know, they charged by the half gram. Yeah, and it was generally not just regular American people. Like, uh, apparently it was mostly like government and military and 
You know, you couldn't, just generally, people couldn't afford to send a letter by Pony Express. Right, right. So, uh, the most news- part. Newspapers would send cables to other newspapers um, or, yeah, like you said, government. Uh, Although the government never officially granted a contract to the Central Overland, um, they would use them, but there was no official contract. And I get the impression that had they ever landed a government contract, they might have actually made money, although I don't think it would have ultimately kept them from their their fate. But um, the fact that they didn't have a wide customer base. They didn't have a, a government contract. And then this was just such an expensive venture and they couldn't possibly make their money back from it. It was, I don't know if we've gotten the point across yet or not. This is a terrible business venture. Yeah, and what made matters worse, I mean, they were likely doomed. Uh, maybe we should hold off the final nail in the coffin until later. Okay. Even though it's pretty obvious if you're paying attention. Uh, but one thing that hurt him along the way for sure was the uh, the Pyramid Lake War. Yeah. Uh, or the Pai- Paiute. Paiute War. Yeah, I even looked it up. That's what Emma saying says it was. <laughs> uh, that was in uh, Nevada and Utah mainly, and that was a war that took a great toll on especially these way stations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you were a, a way station dude, you fared much worse than Pony Express riders as far as uh, activity and attack from Native Americans uh, because you were a sitting duck basically in a station that, that seems to be no more than just like four walls and a dirt floor and maybe yeah. a horse corral and a yeah. thing to put water in. Yeah, uh, on the open prairie. Yeah, you were with, sitting out there. Yeah, and during the Pyramid Lake War, um, hostilities between the Paiute and Shoshones who had banded together with the Pyramid Lake uh, tribe, those, um, those three groups rose up together against um, the settlers, the Euro, uh, the Euro-American settlers who've been um, coming out there and just basically encroaching on their land. Yeah. The the thing that, the straw that broke the camel's back was um, a pair of um, brothers, Euro-American brothers, <clears throat> kidnapped a couple of Paiute, uh, I think 12-year-old girls, and raped them and kept them hidden at the... The, one of these little towns, these little frontier towns, and the uh, Paiute uh, Indians got uh, wind of this and went and found them, killed a couple of the people, burned the town down, and then started going from like town to town, or um, town to town, but also way station to way station. Yeah. Just like um, massacring people there, burning down way stations, just basically like torching all of these places, right? Um, and at first, the, the, Cavalry was called in and grossly underestimated what uh, the Paiute and Shoshone and Pyramid um, group was capable of, uh, and just got got whooped basically. And then the the further reinforcements that got called in were basically able to bring it to a standoff. But this this whole thing just raised tensions from simmering below you know the uh, surface to out an outright what you would call a war between these tribes and the the Americans who were pressing into their land. So from that moment on, it got way more difficult and scarier to be a Pony Express rider. And as per Pony Express history, this happened like 10 weeks after the first rider disembarked. Yeah, so they, I mean, not only did it cost them uh, men, but it cost them about 75 grand and this is an eighteen sixty dollars. It's like two something million today. Yeah, I mean that was a huge loss. So they started. They ramped up their operation to try and make up for that. And all of a sudden, they were delivering twice a week instead of once a week. Uh, and they eventually tried to lower their prices too, but it just none of it w- worked. And financially, it was a mess. Uh, like I said earlier, they didn't really keep a lot of records. Uh, they either didn't keep them or they may have destroyed them. <laughs> That's what I think. To avoid creditors because uh-huh. uh, these guys were not the greatest. Well, I don't know if they weren't the greatest businessmen, but they surely didn't fare well in this case. Well, one of them was supposedly an outright con man, uh, Russell. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he was He was supposedly – he was the, the spokesperson for this this business venture, and he was good at that, but he was not, um, not a great stand-up guy as far as business is concerned. Hmm. So the image that you get in your head of Pony Express are these guys riding full bore on these horses, being chased by Native Americans and desperados, and uh, apparently all the, you know, many of the books over the years, even ones that sound uh, super official, 
a lot of times were just made up stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, when and we'll talk a little bit about who finally got in touch with a lot of these riders, but apparently when they were um, officially on record, they didn't talk a lot about fighting um, the Native Americans or anyone. They talked about the weather stinking, about being ripped off and not being paid, <laughs> uh, sort of like normal business complaints. And it wasn't like the thing that you see at the Wells Fargo Bank. Like, yeah, we rode horses fast, but it it kind of sucked. Right. But the thing is, is like this this was a uh, a legend in its own time is how I've seen it put. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that after a break. How about that? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Ba-da. Um, so, Chuck, we said that, like, uh, the, the Pony Express was a legend in its own time, and that is absolutely true. Like, there was, uh, again, in part of uh, William Russell's uh, superior spokespersonship, I think is a word, um, th- th- they, like, newspapers wrote about it. In Sacramento, they called it the, their, our friend the Pony. Yeah. Um, I think they weren't referring to drugs. I think they were talking about the <laughs> Pony Express. Yeah. But um, like people loved the Pony Express, it was it was just hugely innovative, and the idea that like these guys were out there riding as fast as they can for scores of miles with bandits on their tails just to bring us the mail, people fell in love with this thing. Even though at the end of the day, the thing lasted like eighteen months. Like the Pony Express, and this huge legend that we think of, it was an eighteen month business venture that ultimately failed. Right? Yeah. But it was a legend, um, and one of the reasons it was a legend is because there there were a, um, th- I mean, there were real deal exploits going on on the trail. There were some riders who were just amazing. Like one guy was called, um, what was Pony Bob's last name? Haslam. Yeah. Right. Pony Bob Haslam. He was a, a one of the riders for the the Pony Express who, ironically wasn't as legendary as he should have been because he was the actual real deal, but he ended up being forgotten because I get the impression he wasn't much of a self-promoter. Yeah, he made a legendary documented journey of 380 miles without relief at one point mm-hmm. uh, where he basically rode to rode and rode and rode, went to his station to switch uh, riders, and the guy there was like, well, I'm not going. Like, there's there's Indians out there trying to kill me. And so he was like, all right, I'm going to keep going. And he kept going and delivered the mail and eventually made his way back. And, and it ended up being a 380-mile round trip. And he he's, like I said, there's not a lot of great documentation. But even though he's been lost to history, he was very well documented as an expert writer. Yeah, he definitely was. Um, there was another one called Billy Fisher who had a pretty interesting claim to fame. He was out riding on the trail and um, – it was during a snowstorm. So this is another thing, too. You said that the riders complained about things like the terrible weather. Sure. Like, they were carrying mail from, um, let's see, Missouri to Kansas, Nebraska, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, California. That's some tough weather. Especially, say, like in January. You're going to run into some terrible snowstorms, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, Billy Fisher found himself in one of these snowstorms, and he... For, he just dismounted. He's like, I just got to go over here and go to sleep for a little while in a blizzard. And um, he started to fall asleep and he woke up to something licking his face. And it was a jackrabbit <laughs> who had basically licked his face till he woke up. I didn't know they licked. I, I think this may have been his, his spirit animal, okay. actually. Uh, and the the, uh, the rabbit like startled Billy Fisher and Billy Fisher startled the rabbit and the rabbit ran off, but it woke Billy Fisher up and he said, if that rabbit hadn't licked my face and woke me up, I never would have woken up. I would have just frozen to death out there in this blizzard. But he was woken up enough and realized the gravity of the situation enough that he got back on his horse and kept riding to safety. Sounds like legend. Yeah, and to, <laughs> to top it off, his great-great-grandson is William Fisher, who was one of the U.S. astronauts who flew the space shuttle. Oh, how about that? Le- so, legend. And these stories are like, 
going around and like being circulated in newspapers and among people while the Pony Express is going on. Yeah, I mean, there were some very bad, uh, ex- not exploitive, uh, sensationalist books uh, written over the years. And then there was also a couple of uh, real legitimate dudes, uh, Captain Sir Richard Burton, the famous British explorer, mm-hmm. and one Samuel Clemens, 25-year-old future Mark Twain, they both individually um, kind of spent some time out there documenting the Pony Express. Mm-hmm. And uh, it seems like Burton didn't have a good time out there. He didn't like the West. No, he didn't. He, he always complained about the flies and the fleas and just the the filth and just the people. He just was not a fan. But he still gave a fairly accurate account of, like, the day-to-day of a Pony Express rider. Uh, Clemens, Mr. Future Mark Twain, seemed mm-hmm. to have a good time. And, you know, in his true fashion— wrote some of the uh, – some really flower, flowery eyewitness testimony about seeing these horsemen coming across the tundra and – or the, gonna, the plains. It's pretty cool. You're going to read that? No. It's too okay. long. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody go read that. It's in um, Roughing It, which is his book about traveling the U.S. And he surfs in it. Did you know that? I didn't. He goes to Hawaii and tries surfing when they used to surf on like 10-foot long wooden boards. And yeah, take so just your head clean off. Go re, go read that quote in your in your best Hal Holbrook impression. <laughs> that's nice. And that's really a good way to do it. I'm more a uh, Val Kilmer, Mark Twain guy. Oh, God, that's right. <laughs> I forgot he did that. Uh, everyone did, Chuck. Man, um, so you had Mark Twain and Captain Sir Richard Burton providing like contemporary accounts, but that's like that is virtually it, right? There were. Again, this is a, a failed business venture. Let's go ahead and tell them what happened, why it was a failed business venture, Chuck, why, why it ultimately died. Well, they finally hooked up the two. They finally closed that gap on the telegraph. Mm-hmm. They're like, well, we can go coast to coast now. So mm-hmm. you're, you're sort of immediately, literally immediately out of business. Yeah. The like first, two days later, they closed. The first rider headed out on April 3rd, 1860, and it was October 26th of 1861 where the last one headed out from St. Joe's. And some people will say, well, it didn't actually stop in October. It was actually November because those mochilas sure. didn't end up in, in Sacramento until November. That's fine. Whatever. It was like 18 <laughs> months, 70-something weeks of operation. Um, and people loved it at the time, but... As with most things, once the new, better, greater thing came along, the telegram, they forgot about it pretty quick. And we really honestly would not have any recollection of the Pony Express. It would be a footnote to a footnote in history if it weren't for one guy named Buffalo Bill Cody, who actually is the reason why we all remember the Pony Express. He had a soft spot in his heart for... Um, not just the Pony Express itself, but one of um, the founders, uh, I think it was um, Alexander Majors, right? Yeah, I think so. Who um, He gave him a job when he was a kid. Gave him a job when he was a kid. And while Bill um, would go on, or Buffalo Bill would go on to, uh, to say, well, I was actually a Pony Express writer, all historical evidence suggests that that is not actually the case. But um, he definitely did work for... Uh, Alexander Majors, who was one of the owners of the Pony Express, as a horseback messenger, just not a Pony Express rider, which if you're talking about Pony Express legend, that's a major distinction. Yeah, and Buffalo Bill would also go on to say, is she that great big fat girl? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Is he called Buffalo Bill? Yeah. Okay. I always, for some reason, I thought it was like a, a... a playoff of Buffalo Bill, like Buffalo Bob or something like that. No, it was Buffalo Bill because okay. he, he skinned his victims. Yeah, I remember. Uh, should we take a break? Jeez, okay, sure. All right, let's take a break, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, Buffalo Bill right after this. So Buffalo Bill's Wild West uh, 
I want to always want to say Wild West extravaganza. You can call it that. <laughs> but it was really Buffalo Bill's Wild West. That was the name of his big show mm-hmm. that he took all over the country, uh, delighting people with sharpshooting and horseback riding and all sorts of cool stuff, enchanting America with uh, with the Old West. Not just America, the world. Well, yeah, and that's a, that's a solid point. I mean, he went all over Europe, and that's why, and this article points out, that's why to this day you can go to like a Pony Express-themed club in Germany. Mm-hmm. Because back then he performed in front of Queen Victoria and Kaiser Wilhelm and the and the Pope in Rome. And basically kind of – he always seemed to have at least one reported or purported Pony Express rider in the show. It was like one of the main um, segments of his show. Yeah. So at one point he did have uh, – who was the, uh, the good Bronco, rider? Bronco Charlie Miller? No, no, no. Well, he had him – Oh, uh, Pony Bob Haslam. Yeah, Pony Bob worked for him for a little while, and he is a definite, legit rider. Uh-huh. The other guy, uh, what's his name, Bronco Billy? Bronco Charlie Miller. <laughs> oh, no, that was Clint Eastwood. Bronco <laughs> Charlie Miller claimed to have been a Pony Express rider. Uh-huh. A lot of men claim to have been uh-huh. over the years that were not. Uh, and they traced his his timeline back, and he would have been 10 or 11, which – Really it, stretching it. Like, it, it it's is possible. It is. It's possible because they did go as low as like 13 and 14, but uh, it, it was never super confirmed that this guy actually rode for the Pony Express, but it kind of doesn't matter because apparently everyone loved him. Yeah, and, and so the reason why it's stretching it but still in the realm of possibility is because, so like when, when William Russell would talk about the Pony Express and his company, he would say like, these men have to take an oath not to drink or fight. Yeah, uh, which we, still happened, of course. We, yeah, we have like 80, 80 people in the saddle. And in reality, yeah, they were all drunk around like at all the way stations and on and on the trail. Um, and the the impression is that you, if you needed a rider and there was somebody who said, I'll go, you, oh, you were a Pony Express rider right then. So the idea that a, an 11-year-old kid said, I'll go, and they said, all right, fine, go, that could have possibly happened. So it's possible yeah. Bronco Charlie Miller did ride, but like you said, he was just such a great, like, Old West archetype. He was like they, a relic, yeah. They they were like, what, whatever, we'll believe anything you say. Yeah, so— uh, through the years, like we said, a lot of bad information, a lot of legend, um, everything from uh, from movies like in 1953, a Paramount film called The Pony Express, <laughs> with Charlton Heston as Buffalo Bill. Uh-huh. In the movie, Buffalo Bill teams up with Wild Bill Hickok, Hickok to start The Pony Express. And as this author said, there is not a shard of fact in the entire film. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he meant shred or shard. 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 All right. He could have said shit, though. It works. And then this, the um, if you read this, it sounds super cool, like a notice in the St. Louis and San Francisco newspaper that said, wanted, mm-hmm. young, skinny, wiry fellows, not over 18, must be expert riders willing to risk death daily, orphans preferred, wages $25 per week. And that seems like, man, what a great job listing for the Pony Express. Orphans preferred. <laughs> that was written in the 20th century by a journalist in the... Sunset Magazine. Mm-hmm. So that probably wasn't even true. No, no. That's so like, again, it's, there was, it was forgotten. Like, so I think uh, Alexander Majors wrote his um, memoirs. Remember, he was one of the three guys who owned the Pony Express. He wrote his memoirs like 30, 40 years after um, the, the Pony Express's last ride. Yeah. So, and by this time, most people had forgotten it. And it, again, it was Buffalo Bill who came along, actually paid a visit to Alexander Majors and found him in a fairly sorry state. He was very yeah. broke. He was in poor health and said, you gave me my first job when I was 11 after my father died, and I want to repay you by taking care of you. So he put him in a show. He let him stay at his old Scouts Rest Ranch in Nebraska, uh, just basically took care of him. But he also was like, we've got to publish this book. Yeah. So he got Rand McNabb alley to actually publish this book about the, his life as a, a freight, old West freight legend guy, including the <laughs> Pony Express. And that was some of the earliest documentation about it, but it also kicked off like this history of terrible documentation of just surrounding the whole thing with tall tales and embellishments. And it just very quickly became 
it's very tough to to root fact from fiction, even today, even at some of these places that are like, this is actually, this museum is a, a Pony Express uh, way station. Yeah. It may not be the case. They're not entirely certain what the trail was any longer. They think that there's some pristine segments that are, aren't covered over by um, tracks of some sort, that they're actually like, this is the the course that the Pony Express took, but they're not 100% sure. It just got lost to time. Yeah, and I don't even think we mentioned that Buffalo Bill, um, that job he got was was as a horseback delivery rider for the initial freight company, mm-hmm. but he never rode for the Pony Express, though he, uh, did he outright claim to or just kind of let people oh, assume yeah. that? No, in his, in his, in the notes for the B- Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, it talked about how he was, and then it would say, you should buy his autobiography. It shows even more. And then they would talk in depth about how he rode for the Pony Express, for sure. If you were from the Old West at this time, you were basically expected to just lie constantly about <laughs> yeah, some of the about things you've things. done. And same, not just with um, Buffalo Bill, Wild Bill Hickok said the same thing. He yeah. said he, he worked for the Pony Express too. And he did, but he was one of those guys who ran a way station and tended to the horses. Lame. <laughs> well, he was bigger and older, so he couldn't ride. You know, it wasn't his fault. He's a victim of circumstances. Yeah, there are also a bunch of, uh, there was a series of last living Pony Express riders throughout the years. Um, mm-hmm. Various newspapers, even sometimes multiple times in the same newspaper over the years, would print articles claiming that the last Pony Express rider has just died. Um, so we don't know if, you know, any of them were or not, or if they were the last or not. Uh, and it finally took a woman named, uh, a poet, apparently not a very good one, named Mabel Loving, mm-hmm. who said, why don't, you know, why doesn't someone actually write letters and get in touch with some of these people mm-hmm. and get the, the true dirt? And she did that. She apparently wrote letters and had some correspondence with the surviving Pony Express writers as an amateur poet. And said this was right before uh, World War One, and apparently that is some of the only like real documentation we have from some of the real writers that she eventually published in something called "The Pony Express Rides On!" Exclamation <laughs> point, mm-hmm. uh, which apparently you can still buy if you uh, have a lot of money. Uh, yeah, it's like a collectible, I'm sure. Yeah, I think, and supposedly the um, printers lost a couple of the chapters. So, like, even if you buy a copy, it's not in its intact form because nobody took it very seriously, I think. Yeah. Probably because of the exclamation point. <laughs> it's never a good idea. No. Um, you got anything else? Well, I mean, I guess the postscript is uh, after this telegraph, they, like I said, two days after it was hooked up, they realized that they were done for because they were already in bad financial straits. So Waddell went home to uh, Missouri Mm-hmm. He was broke and in debt. He sold his home to his son for a dollar and still lived there. Uh, and apparently he died in April of 1872, never worked again. Um, Russell, who was only 48, went to New York, failed as a stockbroker. Uh, apparently no one trusted him. He filed for bankruptcy in 1865. Uh, and this was, what, just five years after mm-hmm. uh, it shut down. Sold off his assets to pay his creditors. Went back to Missouri finally because of poor health and died in 1872. And then Majors lived the longest, uh, and we know his story. Like you said, Buffalo Bill helped him publish his book. Right. And if there, if Bronco Charlie Miller really was a Pony Express rider, he definitely by far was the uh, last one to die. He died at 105 in 1955. And years before that, at age 82, he rode from New York to California on horseback to bring attention back to the uh, the Pony Express and the glory of it. Wow. Pony Express. So, final facts, they ended up losing about 200 grand uh-huh. in that day's money, which is millions of dollars now. Right. Uh, the personal best delivery time, apparently, was when they carried uh, Abraham Lincoln's inaugural address they got it to California in seven days, 17 hours. Not bad. And in the end, uh, they delivered about 35,000 pieces of mail over that 18 or 19 months. And I think isn't wasn't only one mail shipment that didn't – only one fail to make it? That's what I understand, yeah. It's a pretty good track record for a failed business. It's not bad at all. They all – they wrote a combined half a million miles in that time. 
pretty great. And again, that's the Pony Express. Totally different than what you thought about, huh? <laughs> but also sort of the same. I just didn't know that it was such a flop. Gotcha. Just bad timing. Terrible timing, man. Um, well, if you want to know more about the Pony Express, well, get on out there on the trail, you varmint, and check it out yourself. Uh, and since I said varmint, it's time for listener mail. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, boy. It's time for... Administrative Detail. All right. Okay, for the uninitiated, uh, this is where Josh and I uh, and Jerry, by way of our voices, thank you Mm -hmm. for the nice things that you have sent us in the mail. Thank you. Gifts, tokens, crafts, Mm -hmm. books, postcards, letters. Yep. By the way, Booze. I didn't log all the postcards and letters. That can be tough. It can be tough. How about a blanket thank you to everyone who sent us postcards and letters? Agreed. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Dan Kent, thank you big time for sending us Pliny the Elder beer and T-shirts. Yes. Uh, thanks to the Bar Fight Supply Company for all the awesome leather goods, including the... Um, uh, the moleskin holder, which I use a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. The business card holders, all that jam. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, Kelly Sumsky of Two Little L's, she sent us a, uh, or sent me, mm-hmm. a painted rock in memory of the wizard, uh, my cat who passed. That is very sweet. And it was very sweet and very sad to get, but in a good way. Uh, good yeah. sad. <laughs> <laughs> Bittersweet. Uh, Chris Walzak sent us beer from Hamburg, New York, and IPA. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Mandy Kruger, you sent me a Ween t-shirt that I wear all the time, mm-hmm. uh, including on stage in Atlanta. I saw it myself. Yep. Um, Anodyne Coffee, uh, they sent us some coffee from Milwaukee. Thanks, Anodyne. Uh, Jeremiah and Mason Brandrick. Uh, oh, I remember this. They sent us the F5 IPA, mm-hmm. which is a beer I had uh, when I spent some time in Tulsa. Mm-hmm. So it's, a, I think, a Tulsa beer. And some beer... In uh, bear in Stein bear shirts, right? Soaked in cologne. It seemingly soaked in cologne. They they they're like here, huh? Well, you look like you smell. <laughs> We're gonna make you pretty. It was interesting. Uh, Julie uh, sent us handmade personalized Christmas ornaments, which it's been a while since we did this. Sure. Um, for Jerry, Yumi, Emily, and the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Those are great, actually. Yeah. That was on my tree. Uh, Kaylee Hamar sent uh, my dog Nico some pet treats. Nice. From uh, pet Treater. Very nice. Uh, Lindsay Lundstrom sent us some wonderful bottle key cap or bottle cap keychains. Oh, those are awesome. Yeah. There was a SYSK one, a Don't Be Dumb one, Last Chance Garage, Mama, Jerry, Red Dragon. And uh, she's out of uh, Etsy and Facebook at Red Dragon Handcrafts. Check them out. You're going to love them. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, Becca sent uh, sent me a library copy of a book, my children's book, that I was so fond of as a kid, The Great Christmas Kidnapping Caper. I'm really excited to read this to my daughter, Becca. Uh, so thank you so much for sending that. Kelly Butler Olson sent Murdered by Death, a copy of Murdered by Death, arguably one of the greatest spoof movies of all time, one of my favorites. So thank you, Kelly. KBO. Yeah. Uh, Taylor Stonehawker sent a lovely Christmas card. And handmade caramels, which were delish. And uh, Nick Stiglich sent us some Stroop waffles, those amazing things that you put over your coffee to heat up. Yeah, we've we got more than one Stroop waffle. So if you Keep also sent Stroop waffles, yeah. many thanks. And just uh, send them again. <laughs> Nathan Ferlazzo. Uh He's actually Australian. Mm-hmm. He's an artist, and he sent us, uh, oh, these are great, a variety of bookmarks, magnets, coloring books, all uh, that are animals with their bodies Made of flowers and plants. Yeah, it's amazing. It's really nice. So you you should check this out. It's online at uh, mariniferlazzo.au. M-A-R-I-N-I-F-E-R-L-A-Z-Z-O.au. Mm-hmm. And a portion of these sales go to wildlife conservation. So gorgeous and well-funded. Speaking of gorgeous, Aiden Dale sent us metal sculpture orchids. And you can find them at Aiden, A-I-D-E-N, Dale, D-A-L-E, dot com. Thank you, Aiden. Uh, just a few more here, folks. Elias Pagurko sent honey from their three-colony 
apiary. That's pretty great. Thanks, yeah, Elias. Elias, that was awesome. Robin sent us beer and mead from Wisconsin, and it was well appreciated and didn't last very long, Robin. Thank you. No, we Ro- did not drink Wisconsin Bleak. Robin, <laughs> that was great. <laughs> That's a t-shirt. I didn't make it up. Oh. <laughs> uh, Bonnie Bowden sent us Moldoramas. Uh, guitars, mm-hmm, yep. which I think it uh, got from Third Man Records in Nashville. Um, and which, w- I think she also sent the Willis Tower one, which I was like, what the heck is the Willis Tower? And I was like, <laughs> oh, that's the Sears Tower. Well, and we got actually more than one person sent us Moldoramas. Yeah, like Luke and David Scherskull, father and son, they sent us elephant Moldoramas from where, Chuck? Toledo Zoo. Bam. Which has probably the largest selection of Moldoramas outside of the Chicagoland area. That's right. You grew up right there in the gorilla cage. That's right. <laughs> uh, Nathan sent us his band CD uh, EP, Missouri Loves Company. Mm-hmm. Or Missouri. Or Missouri. Missouri Loves Company. Uh, Philip LaPalm, great name, sent a Robert Shaw Jaws Christmas card to Chuck. That's right. Uh, and then finally, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I got sent some guitar picks from Forever Pick. And apparently these picks have, like, better sustain and better performance. And I have not yet plucked with them, but I can't wait to use that, my Forever Picks. That is fantastic. Do you have some more? Yeah, we've got just a couple more, Chuck, if you'll bear with me. Take us home, brother. Um, Josh Jones sent us Catfish Head Vodka. Oh, yeah. Thanks a lot, Josh. Um, Doug sent us an amazing poster congratulating us for a thousand episodes. And Olaf and Millie, the shop dog, sent us the amazing railroad spike bottle openers. Remember those? Oh, yeah. You can go to churchmouseforge.com. And, dude, I want to say Ian Newton, who founded the Baltimore Whiskey Company. Uh Uh-huh. Ian has been sending us stuff like uh, this Shot Tower gin. It's kind of like a malty gin that I love. Oh, yeah. Um, Sent that bourbon that you love. Uh Uh-huh. Just has been sending us some pretty great stuff. So, first of all, Ian, thank you. Second of all, Ian, keep it coming. And third, everybody else who's not Ian, go check out uh, Baltimore Whiskey Company's stuff, the Baltimore Spirits Company. Um, They have just amazing booze that's uh, locally made in Baltimore, and you can tell it's like craft distilled stuff. You're going to love it. Delish. So thank you to everybody who sent us anything ever. Yeah. And uh, if you sent us something in between the last administrative details and this one, and we didn't say your name, first of all, we apologize. Secondly, get in touch with us and let us know because we do want to thank you. And it's just an oversight. We're not actually mad at you, okay? (laughs) Please do. And and I have even more. Uh, I want to thank Doug Sashery. I know how to pronounce the name now. I don't know if you guys remember or not, but I mispronounced Tony Cacheri's seasoning, Creole seasoning. Uh, It turns out it's Tony Sachery's. And Doug let me know by sending me tons of Tony Sachery's products, and they're awesome. So thank you, Doug. I also want to thank another Doug, Doug Dixon, the CEO of Jolt Cola, who sent us some Jolt Cola care packages. And then every once in a while, people bring us stuff to our live shows. So thank you to Ron from Dundee, Michigan, for giving me the um, complete DVD set of Thundar the Barbarian, which I'd never seen all the way through because of swimming lessons. And a very nice person gave us gooey cakes at the St. Louis show. Uh, Our friend Dale from Australia sent us a care package of Australian candy to um, acclimate us to Australian candy for our Australia tour. And then John from Capistrano Beach, who sent us a giant puzzle wheel that I have uh, yet to begin to even try to figure out. So thank you, John, for this uh, madness. Uh, If you want to get in touch with us, whether to send us something or just to say hi, you can go on to our website, stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. Check out our T-shirt store at tpublic, T-E-E public, dot com slash stuff you should know. And you can just send us a good old-fashioned email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.